Hey everyone, welcome back to Epic Tomorrows. It's now my great pleasure to welcome back Kaya Heller, who is an author, artist, anthropologist, activist, and an organizer and faculty member with the Institute for Social Ecology, where she has been teaching social ecology and feminist theory for over 30 years. It is also an honor to welcome for the first time Peter Staudenmeyer, who is an author, um, particularly on ecofascism and also a professor of modern German history at the Marquette University in Milwaukee. Um, Peter is also an educator with the Institute for Social Ecology. I will provide links to Chaya's and Peter's works underneath the video. Um, to begin with, I'd just like to explain to viewers and subscribers how this conversation came about. As I was in contact with Chaya and the ISC already after attending two excellent online courses with them, I was then made aware, uh, I think by an email, of some anti-Semitic content in the most recent book of Abdullah Oshalan, The Sociology of Freedom is the book. Oshalan is the ideological leader of the Kurdish liberation movement, uh, who has been in a Turkish prison since 1999 from where he has written uh, his books over the last 20 years. Um, as the Kurdish liberation movement via Oshalan has based some of its theory and practice on Murray Bookchin's ideas, Murray Bookchin being a co-originator of social ecology, of social ecology and as many in the ISC are sympathetic to the radical leftist and anti-statist project of the Kurds in Rojava and other parts of the Kurdish region, the ISC thought it extremely important to maintain support for Kurdish comrades whilst thoroughly deconstructing and denouncing the anti-Semitism in Oshalan's latest work, which was a shock uh, to many people, that anti-Semitism. Um, the ISC has collaborated on an open letter published as a blog post on their website, which I encourage people to read. That will be linked below the video. Um, the ISC also have their own well-established YouTube channel. So it's great that a couple of faculty members agreed to come on my little channel as well. But on their main channel or on their channel, as far as I understand it, they will be uploading a recording of the upcoming panel events that they are hosting, addressing anti-Semitism on the left. If there is still space to attend that online event, I'm not sure if there is, but if there is, I advise my viewers to register quickly. I'll put links below the video. Um, so this conversation we're about to have is a standalone conversation in support of rooting out anti-Semitism on the left and in support of the ISE, but it may also serve as a kind of lead in for some people to the ISE events, and that will help according to how I, how I sort of share this on social media and so on. Moreover, the issues we will be discussing relate to conspiracist thinking in general, so I recommend viewers to attend Peter's uh, talk on conspiracy theories also coming up as an ISC event on November the 17th. Um, and the, the uh, anti-Semitism event is on October the 20th. But as I said, I'll put links below, uh, below the video. Um, finally, before handing over to Peter, first of all, I'll just list the anti-Semitic tropes of uh, Jewish people that were found in Oshalan's recent text, as expounded on in the ISC blog post. First, we have the trope of Jewish power disproportionate to their numbers, meaning, uh, well, commonly, commonly phrased as a, some kind of shadowy global influence or, or new world order, something like that. Then the, uh, another common Jewish trope mentioned was Jewish money, the idea that Jews control all of the banking systems. A third trope in Oshalan's work, common Jewish, a common anti-Semitic trope, sorry, um, was about how, uh, Jews and their control of the state. And Oshalan went further than a lot of anti-Semitic stuff usually does. He even suggested that nation statism itself originates from Zionism. Um, a fourth Jewish uh, anti-Semitic trope was essentialized, essentializing Jews as a singular and relatively sort of homogenous entity, a unified tribe against other tribes, pitted against other tribes. And then finally, we have the trope of the remarkable Jew, the kind of romanticized, uh, romanticized um, yeah, concept used to justify the other 
anti-Semitic tropes as if to say most Jews are nefarious because some clearly aren't, some kind of sort of perverse logic like that. Um, and I would just like to briefly mention as well, which I meant to mention before uh, that last bit, was that my own personal response to the, to the anti-Semitism in, in the sociology of freedom was, yeah, I, I was just surprised and shocked, even to the extent that it seemed like somebody had, it felt to me like somebody else had inserted that material or something. Because like I've read The Roots of Civilization, volume one by Oshalan, and that really impressed me. Um, one comment I would make, which I guess bears on the anti-Semitism in his more recent work, is that because he writes from prison, sometimes his sort of supporting evidence and references aren't so good. So that that's something to bear in mind for people. But yeah, it was actually Oshalan's work and the Kurdish liberation movement that took me back to Murray Bookchin which then took me to the ISC website um, and on your courses. So it was actually Oshalan that brought me to you in the first place. Um, but yeah, so first of all, uh, Peter, draw, drawing on your knowledge of anti-Semitism over the ages, including your extensive knowledge of the Nazis in Germany, um, could you begin to explain something of the origins of these anti-Semitic tropes and perhaps their progression through history? perhaps focusing on the first two tropes, the main ones of Jewish power and money. Um, you can you know, talk for as long as you want, please. Very good. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for having us. I think I'll mostly address the, the second one, if that's okay. The, the first one, the one about power is the, that, that's the founding myth of modern anti-Semitism as such. It takes so many disparate forms that it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. You, you don't know where to start your critique. And in some ways, the, the second one, that association of, uh, of Jews with money, that's maybe an easier place to begin to reconstruct a, a critical account. How, where did these ideas come from? How did they manage to find their way into this guy's work, into this, this book, which is, as far as I know, his most recent book length publication in English translation. They don't always get translated in in order. And Matthew, you noted that it, it it seemed to a lot of us like a shock to find some of that content in the book that was just published in English last year. And I, I understand that. At the same time, I have to say it shouldn't be all that shocking. And the reason is this. The association between Jews and money has been, unfortunately, has been a standard part of left thought for a century and a half now, often critiqued thankfully, but always present. It's like it's always there in the background. And I mean that across different left traditions. I happen to come from an anarchist background myself. It's true for a lot of anarchists. It's true for a lot of different versions of Marxism. It's, it is an unfortunate, but historically pretty consistent and pretty persistent element within left thinking in general. So to find it show up, in a book by a guy whose work is impressive. That's the word that, that you used before, which I completely agree with. A, a man whose work is inspiring, a guy who is in extremely difficult straits, imprisoned by the Turkish state for the past two decades and more. As you pointed out, when he wants to look up a historical fact, he can't Google it. He can't go to the library down the street and take out a few books on it. So keeping all that in mind, it's maybe not as shocking as we might think to see some of these myths, and that's what they are. These are, these are anti-Semitic myths, but they're ones that have a, a lengthy history, going back at the very least into the 19th century. In some cases, you could trace them even uh, further back. So I would make two main points about it. One, about the money thing. One is that because it's such a frequent element in, in a lot of left thought and has been for so many, for, for multiple, multiple generations of, of left activists, I think it's worth pointing out that when you see that myth creep in, in radical contexts, in left contexts, I think it's often the myth of the association between Jews and money. I think it's often a sign of a too simple and too superficial understanding of what capitalism is, of how capitalism uh, functions. It's almost as if people who make that association, it's almost as if they're thinking that capitalism itself can be reduced to the functions of money. In fact, for some critics of capitalism, 
that's basically their message. I'm not attributing this one to, to Bucherland at the moment, but for some critics of capitalism, they do basically believe that capitalism is the reign of money or the realm of money, uh, if you will, rather than seeing money as one cog in a much more complex uh, economic and social system. So when I encounter that particular myth, the myth that says there is a special Jewish relationship to money or to making money or what have you, I think it's, a, it's an occasion for the rest of us to step back, step back and ask ourselves, why do we think money is so important in the first place? From my point of view, if you take a structuralist, anti-capitalist perspective on how modern capitalism operates today, I would say that money is not a driving factor. It's a driven factor. We could get into arguments about how that works economically and socially, but, but to my mind, that's a much better way of, of conceiving of the system that many of us oppose. So that's point number one, that this is, this is a chance for us to re-examine some long-standing left assumptions about money and what it means, in addition to long-standing left myths about Jews and their supposed association with uh, making money. The second point is that, historically speaking, there is very little basis for this myth. I say very little and I don't say no basis at all. That's the problem with myths. If, if a myth is going to be effective in the world, if a myth is actually going to take off and start to uh, colonize people's minds, it's going to have to have at least a kernel of truth to it. That's what, that's what good myths do. I don't mean good in the normative sense. That's what effective myths do. That's how they disrupt and distort our thinking is by weaving into themselves some elements of truth. And there is a tiny element of truth in this longstanding myth of a special Jewish relationship with money. But from a broader historical perspective, especially the further back you go, historically, we could, have, we could have arguments about where does capitalism even emerge? When, where, what century, what part of Europe, if you think it emerges in Europe, does it first emerge in agrarian contexts or in urban contexts? A lot of those questions are still not settled and we do not have to try to settle them here. But the further back you go, then when you look at non-capitalist societies before the emergence of the modern nation state and modern capitalism, the historical record about what Jews actually did, economically speaking, is complicated. It, it depends on where you're looking and when, what century, what region, even just looking at Europe, which part of Europe and at what point in time. And there are still very much vigorous historical debates going on. Different scholars take different positions on those questions. However, at the risk of slightly oversimplifying, I would say that in general, the historical reality is most Jews were not moneylenders. It seems weird to say it that way because when you think about it, that's obvious of what group that's ever existed historically has the majority ever consisted of money letters. The idea, the idea is preposterous if you think about it, but nonetheless, it's a really long-standing myth, so it's it's worth puncturing directly. Most Jews were not moneylenders, and the reverse is also true. Most moneylenders were not Jews doesn't matter where you're looking, how far back historically you go, even in periods where money lending was not all that important historically, it was never a Jewish uh, specialty, so to speak. Secondly, most Jews were not merchants, and most merchants were not Jews. That bears, it's good for us to remind ourselves of that historically. Jews were not central, even, even just when we look at the medieval era. Jews were not central to medieval commerce or medieval finance. Jews were not central to early modern commerce or early modern finance. What it comes down to is this, Jews were not pioneers of capitalism. That is a, I admit that is a widespread belief. It's a belief that is held by supporters of capitalism and critics of capitalism. It's a belief that is held by Jews and by non-Jews. It's held by rightists, by leftists, by centrists. It's a very widely held belief, but historically speaking, it just isn't true. Jews were not pioneers of capitalism at most. At best, you might say the Jewish communities and Jewish individuals were, they were like stowaways in the transition into modern capitalist societies. They were passengers on the deck of that ship. And as the societies that they belonged to were swept along into the modern era in its capitalist and nation statist form, but they were never piloting the ship. They were never driving the ship. They were never the captains. They were never the navigators. They were never driving the, 
the, the engine room or powering the ship. When you look at it from that point of view, I hope it becomes a little bit easier to start to deconstruct, to use your word again, Matthew, to try to deconstruct some of the ideologies that have tended to distort our understanding of anti-Semitism. One last point that I'll make, and then we can uh, turn it over to Chaya for a bit. This last point has less to do with Ochelan, and for that matter, less to do with the widespread myths about a supposed relationship between Jews and capitalism historically. It has more to do with how we understand anti-Semitism today. And I want to make this point in part because this is going to go up on YouTube as I understand things, and I have no idea who's going to who's gonna watch this video and share it and talk back to it, which is great and argue against some of the things we're saying, which I love. I like to have dialogues like that. I don't know who's gonna to listen to it. So I do wanna make some, some important point about how we conceive of the, the role of anti-Semitic myths in today's society, now in the 21st century. And the point is simply this. I, I would say that a lot of progressives, a lot of liberals, a lot of people who consider themselves somewhere or other on the left broadly conceived, a lot of those folks consider anti-Semitism a kind of aberration. They look at anti-Semitism and they see it as a sort of a throwback to previous eras. They don't understand how could it possibly persist in the 21st century. They view it as an aberration in various different senses. I think that is a mistake. In fact, I think it's a profound mistake. And I would say it's one that, it's one that radicals can't afford to make. I would argue, in contrast, that anti-Semitism is more of a built-in component of the formation of modern society in its current capitalist and statist forms. What that means, if, if what I just said is true, and we could obviously argue about it, but if that's true, what it means is the only way to overcome anti-Semitism is through a radical transformation of the basic structures of society. And on that score, we might even go back to other aspects of Abdullah Öcalan's work, ones that are not tainted by, their, by these various distortions and anti-Semitic myths. We might draw on other elements of his work for some help in trying to figure out how we could move toward a radical transformation of the basic structures of contemporary society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That, that, was, that was really great uh, and very energetic as well. Um, and I'd just like to reflect one thing back from that, which is that, yeah, the more we teach, well, the more we learn and, and teach about how capitalism really works, the deeper, the deeper mechanisms of capitalism, that in itself can counteract uh, anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, that's really great. And so now moving on over to you, Kaya, if I could ask, um, focusing more on problems with anti-Semitism on the contemporary left. Um, hang on, here we go. Could you talk about your impressions of anti-Semitism on the contemporary left, including, it could include Oshelan's recent work, but also I know you mentioned uh, in an email, you could perhaps speak to the recent scandal surrounding, well, in recent years, um, anti-Semitism in the UK Labour Party and how that was dealt with, um, or anything else you want to bring up. And also I wanted to add, um, why, or do you think anti-Semitism is not, I think Peter's already kind of answered this, but, well, let me put it like this. Why isn't anti-Semitism taken as seriously as anti-Black racism and other forms of racism? Why is it not taken as seriously? Thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you to you, Matthew, for creating this space. It's really generous of you and important. Um, and thank you, Peter, for your you're always thoughtful and energizing comments. Um, so there's sort of, I could sort of unpack two pieces. One is, you know, a recent case or a current case. That's, you know, the case of Ojalan's writings about Jews. And um, also why isn't anti-Semitism prioritized, generally speaking, um, by leftist movements? And I'll sort of take them um, one at a time. First of all, I think that the case of Ojlan to me was not, when I, when I started reading the words, I wasn't actually surprised um, that this man wrote those words. 
because I've been aware that the, the Turkish left, where Ajlan was raised as a you know, young person and went to university and was, you know, that the culture of the Turkish left is very anti-Semitic because there's a lot of very open, explicit anti-Semitic um, thinking that's part of the culture, um, not just in Turkey, but in many parts of the world where it's not considered taboo. So when Ajlan was writing and, and, and thinking about power and coming of age as a leftist, it wasn't taboo to talk about Jews in this way. It wasn't taboo to write about Jews in this way and to attribute to Jews you know, some of the evils and um, ills that come with modernity, such as capitalism or the nation state. So I wasn't surprised by that. To me, what's been really challenging and difficult as a leftist is kind of looking at sort of the network of people, places and things surrounding Ajlan's text. If you take, you know, his pages of Jewish, he calls it Jewish ideology. Um, and just the idea that there is a, he believes he's, he's positing a singular Jewish ideology as a thing that needs to be, he says many times, this is an important thing that must be addressed. The left, if the left doesn't address it, we'll never achieve our goals. We have to address Jewish ideology. Um, so if you believe, so him believing that is, is not surprising. What's surprising to me is that he wrote these words um, they've been around at least for about 13 years. Um, I think the translation might have improved a bit over being going through a few different translators. But these ideas he's been holding for, um, and I've from talking to, his, to um, historians who are such as Corey Kustat, um, this is part of the way that he's been writing about Jewish people for decades. This is not new. It's not about not having access to um, you know, citations and good references in prison because he's not stating historical facts. There are a few times where he does and it's very obviously wrong. He's putting out conspiracy theories that are not facts you can go fact check in a library. He's making sweeping, broad sweeping comments that are not, again, something you, oh shoot, should I like go and, and find out of that broad sweeping comment, you know? So conspiracy theories really aren't fact checked it's not what they're there, you know, people do, do that with that kind of material. So again, I wasn't surprised by the text, but you know, for a text to have life, somebody, and if it's written say in, in Turkish, it has to have a translator who decides this is an important text to translate and then has to have somebody who's going to publish it with the translated text. And then it has to have people who are going to promote the text itself, and then it has to have people who's going, who are going to defend that text. And those are the things that have been very um, troubling to me, um, is that the person, you know, the, a Kurdish leader who, who did translate this text, you could say, you know, why, why didn't they take that out of the, the book? And they could have chosen to take it out or leave it, but the fact that they left it in as is, um, without any kind of caveat or anything is, you know, a really significant decision to do that, to decide I'm going to translate, I'm going to promote it. Um, and that then an American press, lefty press, decided to publish this without any kind of caveat or discussion. Um, but then when Jewish people and allies, um, scholars of anti-Semitism, came to Kurdish leadership to talk about how did this happen, instead of the translators or the leaders saying, my goodness, we have to really rethink this, um, they said, there's no anti-Semitism here. And I they said, literally, the quote is, I will not accept this. I do not, I will not accept that you Jewish people and you um, Jewish allies, scholars of anti-Semitism see anti-Semitism here. And what's really amazing about this, it was a really incredible experience for me to have two very long dialogues, two two-hour dialogues with people who care a lot about the integrity of Ajlan's legacy. Um, to watch them really defend his anti-Semitic writing as accurate um, 
which means they agree with the anti-Semitic things he's saying. So it means that they hold the same anti-Semitic views. And what was more troubling even than that is that they actively tried to suppress and wanted to, they did whatever they could to get, to try to persuade people not to make a public, um, to, to address the anti-Semitism in any public way. And that has been very troubling and it's an ongoing problem. And so that leads me to my next issue around how leftists deal with anti-Semitism when it emerges in movements is that um, what happened around the, the Ojlin text is exactly what I've seen happen over and over again, where you have people say, oh my goodness, here's a real instance of, it could be more flagrant. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen one human being, Jewish or not Jewish, read these pages and not say, whoa, this is really, really flagrantly anti-Semitic. Um, I've never seen that happen where people don't step back and say, okay, we need to fix this. But instead, they actually went forward to say, please, this, now we have leftists saying to other leftists, don't, don't address this publicly. Don't address anti-Semitism publicly in our movements. And what happens in these cases is that it's very sad um, that Jews in organizations are pitted against each other. People who work together for 30, 40 years now are on either sides of a divide that's just so ugly where some Jews are saying we have responsibility to address all forms of racism and anti-Semitism is a really important form of racism to address. And then you have other Jews saying, no, if we address this, we're going to destroy the Kurdish liberation movement one and two, it's going to make anti-Semitism worse. And you know, that is something that non-Jews don't often hear, but that Jews say to each other. So during this period of seven, eight months, I've been sort of thinking about this text and the reaction to the text. I've had so many different Jewish people say to me, these are Jewish leftists who I respect and admire. Haya, this will make anti-Semitism worse. It's going to make the situation for Jews all over the world worse if we become visible and public and we agitate and we draw attention to ourselves, it's going to make people kind of hate us more. So that is very, it's a very painful reality. And it's one that I've seen since my sort of entree into the left in my early twenties when at 21 is we can't ever address anti-Semitism as leftists in movements either because one will destroy the movement, whatever it is. We'll, we'll, it'll, we'll, it'll flatten it. It'll divide people so much. It'll, it'll, it'll harm people's reputations. It'll be terrible. So that's the one. And two, it's going to make anti-Semitism worse. And as long as the left has those kinds of ideas, we're you know in big trouble. And I'll just say you know when I was in my late twenties, I was part of the um, left green network. And I was part of a group of people, small group of people um, that were so excited to have a very prominent leftist um, intellectual who's going to be part of our left green um, journal. He's going to be one of the editors. We had a weekend meeting. And during that meeting, he kind of let it rip. And a lot of what he said is exactly almost to the letter of what Ajlan wrote here. Like, I'm really not exaggerating. It's like, literally, it's the same narrative. And we were after this, you know, hearing all of this, my group of left green folks sat together and we talked about what we do. And what was decided was we can't make this public. We can't confront this person. We can't in any way address this publicly because it'll destroy the green movement. It'll destroy the left green network. And again, the same thing is going to bring more violence or, or more negativity or more um, hostility towards Jews. We're going to make anti-Semitism worse. So here I am in my early 20s, you know, experiencing this. And now, <laughs> towards, you know, now I'm in my going to next year, my sixth decade of life. And there has been, I mean, I, I, to say there's been no progress is an understatement. Um, it's actually gotten worse, I would say. So this case to me isn't just about Ujlan. It's about a snapshot of where the left is at regarding anti-Semitism and how 
terrified Jews are of being to, are of publicly taking a stand against it um, because they know it'll come at great cost to their credibility as leftists. And they don't want to risk the reputations that they've worked on building for so many years. And they don't want to risk their, their, you know, upstanding kind of place in the movement, you know, for like, I'm not going to risk what I've built up and my reputation for this issue that's not even so important. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say a couple of brief points and then I hand back over to Peter. Um, um, yeah, that, that was very, very uh, educating for me. Like, um, I guess I was quite naive about Osherland's potential motivations. I, and, I, I, and I didn't know about the culture of, of where he sort of grew up so much or went to university. Um, and also it's very moving. Your, 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 um, as you spoke, there's clearly a lot of emotion in there. And, and yeah, I feel for you that you've, you've had to deal with these difficult conversations. Um, but I wanted to make a couple of points that the Kurdish liberation movement, um, particularly the feminist wing, as I understand it, as I've learned, is supposed to pride itself on self-reflection and self-critique. Um, so, you know, if they can't deal with this, then there's, there's, a, there's yeah, that's a real, that doesn't align, that doesn't align with the supposed sort of rigorous self-critique. And the other, and the other point, yeah. the other point I'd make is, um, without wanting to dismiss uh, people's fear, which is understandable, but I would suggest that if a green movement can't handle this, or, or any movement can't, leftist movement can't handle these conversations in the open, then if the movement will be blown apart or whatever, then the movement isn't strong enough, is it? Exactly. You know, it needs to be, the movement needs to be, be strong enough to deal with that kind of, and that's a that's a bad reflection on on whatever the movement is or, or work needs to be done there. I have to say it's true that Hi and I and other people who have been involved in this over the past year now, which is crazy that it's taken that long, we disagree on on some of the details. But I have to say I agree, sadly, with Haya's uh, brief portrait of the attempts at dialogue with people who are closer to. Abdullah Öcalan with some of his editors and translators, including people in that small group, including people I really respect, people I've, I've known in the movement for a, a long time. That was a really difficult uh, and disappointing process. And I want to offer a partial, it's not even an explanation. I want, I want to throw something out there that might help make a little bit more sense of why we seem to hit this stone wall in this particular case, where a group of otherwise extremely smart, extremely perceptive people basically crossed their arms and said, nope, not a, not a hint of anti-Semitism anywhere in this text. Part of the problem there might come down to a seemingly simple question, that is, what do we even mean by anti-Semitism? What is anti-Semitism in the first place. And Matthew, you mentioned at the beginning that part, part of what I focus on uh, as a historian is the Nazi period. That's absolutely true. A lot of my research is on Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And one of the, one of the difficulties for anybody who was born in the latter half of the 20th century or anybody born in the 21st century for that matter is our viewpoint on everything that happened before 1945 is distorted by the, the, the fact of Nazism, by what the Nazis did, by the enormity of the Holocaust, by the ability of a, of a modern nation state to put a genocidal program into action, targeting Jews, merely by virtue of the fact that they were Jews, that unfortunately distorts our sense of what anti-Semitism has meant historically. The Nazis were not, 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 not a good standard or, or an average example of anti-Semitism. Nazi anti-Semitism was highly unusual in historical terms. If we take Nazism to be, or if we take genocide to be the central component of what it means to be an anti-Semite, if we did that, we would be letting generation after generation of actual anti-Semites off the hook, including the people who coined the term anti-Semitism in the first place. The, the word anti-Semitism was coined by anti-Semites themselves in Germany in the latter half of the 19th century. They, did not, they didn't even envision genocide 
they hadn't gotten there, so to speak, in their thinking. They believed in various forms of exclusion, various forms of discrimination, various forms of persecution, but they certainly did not have a plan for uh, killing millions of people. If you have that more, if you have that broader historical conception of anti-Semitism in mind, what it effectively boils down to is this, anti-Semitic beliefs are founded on the notion of Jewish responsibility for negative aspects of social reality. And I say that so generally because it's crucial for understanding how flexible anti-Semitism is. Negative aspects of social reality can be virtually anything at all. There have been anti-Semites who blamed communism on Jews. There have been anti-Semites who blamed capitalism on Jews. You can blame almost anything that you don't like in the existing social world. You can somehow pin it to some kind of Jewish responsibility or a Jewish ideology, to use the term that shows up in Uchelan's sociology of freedom. To my way of thinking, for a lot of scholars who study the history of anti-Semitism, that's the basic impetus behind anti-Semitic beliefs. They do not have to involve active killing of anyone at all. The, the underlying notion is when something goes bad in the social world, pin the responsibility for it on some supposedly Jewish force. So if that's true, it means we have an opportunity here with this, with the, uh, the public discussion and debate about the passages in Ochelan's book. And we have a chance to do more than simply pinpointing the problems in that book itself. We can look at what does the fact that anti-Semitism exists, that it still exists even after the Holocaust, 70 years later, that it exists on the right, on the left, in the center of society. What does the fact of anti-Semitism's astonishing endurance and astonishing breadth, what does that tell us about the ways our societies are constituted? What does anti-Semitism tell us about the existing social order as such? What does it tell us about our strategies for those of us who want to change the existing social order? What does it tell us about our strategies for doing so? Which ones are likely to succeed? Which ones are likely to fail? I do not want to draw the attention away from all the extremely important things that, that Haya said. To my mind, it's more, it's more of an opportunity to expand our framework a little bit and see what does this one incident reveal about much broader and more longstanding patterns on the left. Okay, thank you for that, Peter. Um, uh, there's a lot to reflect on there. I think um, part, part of what you said relates to my next question for you anyway. Um, I don't know um, if I can ask this in a slightly looser way than I was going to, so that you can continue your thread a bit. But, I mean, you've already, you've already implied that anti-Semitism is kind of integral to the structures of um, capitalism, um, nation-statism, and so on. Um, I was going to ask, but maybe this can be, you can take this what way, you take this in a new direction, but I was going to ask you to comment on the prevalence of conspiracy theories at this moment in history in the context of QAnon, Trumpism, COVID-19, mass vaccination programs, and also I think quite significantly, which not many people are focused on so much maybe yet, but I think they will be, is the United Nations attempts to coordinate global reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And well, no, that, I mean, that is Agenda 21. Yeah, that is a conspiracy theory, isn't it? Um, or, or the source of the conspiracy theory. Um, so could all of, in what respect, could you speak to, to these factors contributing to perhaps a rise in anti-Semitism um, via new world order global elites type theories? And also, as I know you've co-written, co-authored a book on eco-fascism, how, um, I guess in Europe and America in particular, it would be how, how reactionary white nationalism um, could be linking together with eco-fascism um, and that could be fueled by or underpinned by rising anti-Semitism potentially, as, especially as the climate crisis gets, gets worse. Is that, do you think I'm on the, on the right track here? Sure. Um, I would love to hear some of Aya's thoughts on a couple of the questions you just raised. So I'll, uh, I'll be a, a fairly brief right now. I see conspiracy thinking as the almost perfect setup 
for the kinds of left-right crossover that I also study. A lot of the background to that book on ecofascism, which is 26 years old now, a lot of the background to that had to do with what my co-author and I, Janet Beale, what we noticed about elements within the environmental movement back then in the 90s, where you saw this unsteady mixture of left and right uh, beliefs and notions and assumptions. And conspiracy thinking is, the, is just about the ideal venue it's, it offers, uh, it's, it is broad enough and diffuse enough and politically confused enough that it offers a space where people who see themselves as being on the right and people who see themselves as being somehow around the, on the left, where they can come together and express their discontent with whatever it is that's currently going on in their society that generates uh, discontent. So the, the appeal of conspiracy theory is, unfortunately, across the entirety of the political spectrum. It is, not, it is not a peculiarity of the far right. I kind of wish it was, but um, sadly uh, it is not. And something similar could be said about anti-Semitism. I think that, that question is actually a little bit trickier and a little bit more complex, but at its root, most modern forms of anti-Semitism depend on a conspiracy theory. You might say that anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory writ large, that that's how it, that's how it gets its work done. And I think Haya was exactly right a little while ago when she said, you can't really fact check a conspiracy story. That's, that's not going to make much of a dent in the, in the conspiracist mindset. It's not going to change the ongoing appeal of uh, conspiracy thinking. So while I would love to talk for hours on end about the, the current far right and its views on environmental subjects, et cetera, et cetera, I think the more important point for our purposes right now is not to get too comfortable, for those of us who see ourselves as on the left, not to get too comfortable and just remind ourselves that conspiracy thinking and anti-Semitic beliefs, those things appear across the entire political spectrum, very much including our own corner of it. Absolutely. It's okay. Kaya, if you want to go ahead with um, your thoughts on this. Me? Yeah, if, if you would like to. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, Peter speaks so beautifully, that was really beautifully um, said. What I could, I think, maybe, maybe add to that is that to me, anti Semitism is a theory of everything that is kind of like a bag that has something for everyone. And so, you know, if you're anti immigration, here's the anti Semitism because Jews are. Believe it or not, the ones who are bringing in black and brown people into the U.S., for instance, and destroying the, you know, the white bloodline, right? Um, if you are somebody who's really just hates black people, here you go. Um, Jews basically, or basically orchestrated the entire civil rights movement because black people certainly were too intellectually inferior to be able to do that on their own. So Jews created every uppity black person you see you can thank a Jew for that because they created these movements. Jews are behind BLM if you don't like that. Jews are behind defund the police. So let's okay, so what else? If you don't like, you know, if you don't like the va the vaccine mandates, let's bring a Jew. That's the Jew who's making money off, you know, from big pharma, that's corporate medicine, etc. So it's this grab bag for with something for everyone. And it's, it's just so fungible and plastic that uh, it makes it very, very dangerous because it creates a way to kind of bring people together across the right and across the left and across racialized lines. There are people, they're black um, Marxists and black and, and people who are Muslim who are coming into the to embrace anti-Semitic conspiracy theories as well. So, so it's really, it's like this great magic wand of bringing people together to ultimately take down the left. I mean, and that is why this matters so much to not just Jews, but to the left, because we can't move forward um, as a left if we're being infiltrated and directed by anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that undermine our abilities to really understand how power really is working and what is really driving immigration and what's really driving the climate crisis. And what's really, you know, we can't understand how we got here and where to go if we're relying on these conspiratorial theories that scapegoat chooses the power that, 
you know, is behind everything. Um, I also wanted to say that, you know, I, when, when I read Ibrahim Kende's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, I remember thinking, one of the things I love about his approach is that being an anti-racist isn't just a passive, you know, state of mind. It's not just, well, I'm not a racist. I don't have racist thoughts. It's that it's an active um, pursuit of one's curiosity about history, right? So to be anti-racist, if you're living in the U.S., a post-slavery society, it means becoming very actively um, involved as a researcher to understand the history of slavery in this country and Jim Crow and, you know, that's on everybody in this, you know, in this country to understand this history of how we got to the mess, you know, last summer with George Floyd and all the George Floyds before George Floyds. So I love that he says, you, you know, it's not just a passive state of mind, it's an active, it's an activity. And to me, for the left to become a fully anti-racist movement, it has to embrace anti-Jewish racism. And, you know, I don't use the word anti-Semitism all that much anymore because the term was fabricated by somebody to make anti-Jew hate or, or Jew hate sound more social scientific. There are no Semite people. Um, it was a way to make European Jews sound not um, European. It's a way to make Ashkenazi Jewish people like me look like we were primordially, primordially um, and essentially Middle Eastern. Um, when Jews have been in Europe for 2000 years. Um, so I feel like for the left to really say, we're, 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 we're gonna go full stop for an anti-racist kind of program, we have to include anti-Jewish racism, which is an early one of the earliest forms of racism, where you take a group of people and see them as sharing a biological essence, genes, you know, that's been the same throughout time across the globe, we have to have an active anti-Jewish racist curiosity and movement. And people have to be willing, I think, to read, you know, just like people starting to read, thank God, a lot of, you know, so many important um, books written by black and brown scholars, people have to start reading books about anti-Semitism because they have to realize it really is in their own interest as leftists, not just as people who are Jews or allies to Jews, but as leftists. If you wanna have a truly anti-racist left that can take down capitalism and, and transcend authoritarianism and transcend hierarchies such as the state and heteropatriarchy, then we have to take down anti-Semitism, which is used to drive those other kinds of racism and to drive and to rationalize and normalize the world that we're living in as a whole. So, you know, how do you become an active anti-Jewish, um, an anti-racist who takes on anti-Jewish racism? How do you do that, become that active kind of person? And to me, it's kind of like there's, there's three prongs. One is you get curious and you look for, there's so many interesting books and articles and I don't, I can't give you a whole bibliography here, but the Institute for Social Ecology, I'm really proud to say, is one of the only leftist organizations that prioritizes looking at anti-Semitism. So you could take Peter um, and Blair Taylor's understanding anti-Semitism class. You can come to the ISA and ask for, I think we're gonna put together, definitely for after this panel, a reading list. You can also get together with people and create a study group and create a little syllabus. And that could include watching some really interesting documentaries together. Um, also, you could invite speakers from the ISC or other speakers or people who are actively fighting anti-Semitism to come speak to your group. We have Zoom technology that we're getting more comfortable with now. The study group from anywhere in the world could ask somebody from ISC or from anywhere to come and sit with them um, in their group to talk about this. And the last thing is that if you're, again, if you, if you, and you're, you as an individual or as an organization, you have a commitment to being anti-racist, always make sure that anti-Jewish racism is on the agenda. And when it's not, ask why it's not and ask people to be curious about why it's not. And it might not be, it's probably not malicious or intentional at all. And that's precisely the point. 
It's that we're trying to raise consciousness of why it's important. So if it's not there, it's because people don't understand why it's important. And so that's like a main thing for myself. It's like, okay, how to really get people to get, this needs to always be part of the anti-racist agenda on the left. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm really glad. I'm really glad that you, you, you added that practical um, sort of end section. And um, so uh, it, uh, along the same lines, Peter, have you got any ideas on sort of practical ways moving forward? Sure, minor, minor brief. They, they are sub points to uh, addenda to the beautiful things that Haya just said. The first one I, I would recommend is for people doing this kind of self-reflection, uh, collective self-education through study groups or whatever other format, what I would recommend is try to pay attention to the ways in which anti-Semitic beliefs are uncannily able to mimic radical ideas. That's one of the, um, that's one of the most important aspects of modern anti-Semitism as, as a worldview, as a belief system, as a mindset, is its ability to look like it's doing the same things as radical critiques of capitalism, of the nation state, of what have you. I, I would ask people to pay attention to how does that work? How, how do they pull that off? How, how does anti-Semitism pull that off? And in that spirit, I'm going to read you just a one sentence quote, a very brief quote from a guy named Moish Postone, who passed away a few years ago, very important scholar of and historian of uh, anti-Semitism, among other things. Postone wrote near the end of his life, anti-Semitism fuses the deeply reactionary with the apparently emancipatory in an explosive amalgam end of quote. I think he's on to something there. Anti-Semitism has this ability to bring left-wing and right-wing beliefs together in an especially dangerous way. So when we're doing the kind of education, self-reflection, learning, and curiosity that, that Haya is talking about, try to make that part of the task. And the last point I would say is, is a very a seemingly very simple one, a very straightforward one. I am going to I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that at least some of the people who end up viewing these video clips, that some of those people have probably had the unpleasant experience in their own life of having been accused of anti-Semitism, and they think the accusation is wrong. In a lot of cases, it is wrong. It's important for us to recognize that anti-Semitism, like any other term, like any other concept, it can be abused. It can be tossed around like an epithet rather than being used critically and carefully and contextually in a way that helps illuminate something that's actually going on in the real world rather than as a handy label for something that didn't actually quite happen that way. So if you've had that experience, you people out there who are complete strangers to me, what I would say is two things. Don't let it discourage you. Don't let it deter you. And two, don't let that be a reason to abandon the term anti-Semitism or to give up on the concept of anti-Semitism. I mentioned an hour ago or something now, I'm an anarchist. I come from the anarchist movement. I am acutely aware that for millions of people out in the world today, anarchy means destruction and violence and chaos and bomb throwing and God knows what else. It's not what it means to me. It's not, it's not what it means to any anarchist in the world. It doesn't stop us from using a term like anarchy or anarchism in responsible and reasonable ways. The same way we can use a term like democracy in responsible, critical, and meaningful ways, despite the fact that that term is contested and fought over and people have radically disagreeing notions about what it means. The exact same thing is true for the concept and the term of anti-Semitism. I fully take Haya's point. In fact, I'm gonna to have to go home and think more about Haya's point that because of the tainted origins of the term itself, that might be reason for us to eventually give up on it. But as long as it is still the one, the word that means what it means in English, don't let the fact that it is sometimes falsely applied to people who don't merit the term, don't let that stop you. Use that as an occasion to think through when is that term appropriate? When can it be applied in ways that are well-founded, critical, and thought through? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a really great, really important point. Um, I, I'm just going to remind my subscribers and viewers to investigate all of the links underneath this video thoroughly, which will include links to upcoming ISE events. Um, also, any 
important links that Peter and I want to send me, I can put underneath the video. Um, but for now, um, Peter Staudemeyer and Kaya Heller from the IRC, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I'll see you later on.